Jennifer Beamer, owner operator of Actually Dyed Art by Science, and this is Iron Age Textiles series episode one. And in this video, we're going to be covering two topics. The first one is experimenting, and the second one will be experimental archaeology. Okay, so experimenting. What do I mean by that? Well, it's the way that we solve problems by responding to our environment, our needs, past experiences, and dealing with the unknown. And this is very important because if we don't know how to deal with something, then we don't have any personal references that would be most applicable. So what we do is we formulate a hypothesis and carry it through, and depending on the results of that little experiment, we either think that it worked, it didn't work, or there's some variation in between uh, in terms of interpretation. So for example, let's say there's a hole in the wall and you've never had to fix a hole in the wall before. So you might draw on a variety of experiences, maybe you've observed somebody in the past uh, doing home improvement tasks, and so you think about the materials and techniques that you have available to you, and you might think through the process of fixing it before you begin. And then once you have everything assembled and you fix the hole in the wall, you assess the results. So how well you were able to uh, design the experiment, uh, carry it through, and the hypothesis was, um, did I do this well? <laughs> Is it fixed? And depending on all those factors, you might conclude, yes, I did an excellent job, I'm really quite proud of myself, or maybe you just are gonna skip the whole fixing problem, <laughs> at least for now. Uh, and you might even go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, that didn't work, you two, please help me. So this is experimenting in a nutshell, and um, it's, it's very familiar to you. Experimental archaeology. Well, I'll start off by saying what it isn't. It is not replication, it is not reconstruction, and it is not reenactment. Although you can use these uh, principles as guiding frameworks when you are engaging in those practices. Experimental archaeology is a methodological framework that actually has two ways that you can go about doing it. The first way is doing lab based controlled experimenting where you hold all your variables constant in controlled conditions like a lab and change one variable to see how that change in uh, what variable you're looking at affects the other variables and because it's controlled you can be ensured that those uh, changes are a direct reflection of that change in the variable. The second is um, actualistic or real life versions of experimenting. So that takes into account the environment, the setting, putting multiple variables together, and if you make change to one variable, it actually might change a couple of variables um, when you do that change. So it looks more at the way variables change together, which is important because if you are talking about in the past, um, people aren't working in labs when they're creating things. It's, it's more in a uh, real world or lived context. So what are some of the drawbacks of these methods? The first one in lab-based controlled experimenting, I think it's kind of inherent in what we think of when we hear the word lab or laboratory. So it's sterile, it's very confined, it's restrictive. And sometimes when you do experiments with these conditions in place, it might create some awkwardness. It doesn't have that living flow that might have been there in the past. So it is kind of difficult to understand how some of these uh, variables relate together because you're only looking at one variable at a time. For actualistic environments, again, it's that problem where if you have lots of variables going on, it's really difficult to assess how a change in one variable affects the others because you might be changing multiple variables at a time to make sense for the lived experience or the lived world, but you can't say that this change will affect these other variables in this sort of way. So it becomes a challenge to then say that, you know, people might have done something in this particular fashion because we don't know how 
uh, changing one variable actually affects the other variables, and you can't necessarily draw that kind of conclusion. What's important to know about these two ideas of experimenting, lab-based and actualistic, neither is superior to the other. In fact, with the pros and cons that I've listed, you can kind of get a sense why one works and one doesn't work for d depending on the application. So um, in reality, it's probably best to do both lab-based experiments and actualistic experiments looking at the same kinds of questions so that you get kind of this spectrum approach to your experimentation process. Experimental archaeology is also a process in addition to being a framework. And essentially it's uh, how you might experiment within the confines of the archaeological record. So, for example, with my experiments, I was looking at whether threads produced from spindles found at Danbury could be used with the heavy lumines that were also recovered from that context. The actual research question I wanted to investigate was very simple, and it was this. I'm going to read it to you now. Is it possible that a spindle whorl from Danbury can produce yarn for the heavy lumines found in association and weave with it? That sounds pretty simple and straightforward, and um, it didn't seem like it was overly complex. There weren't lots of things I wanted to look at, and I didn't want, uh, or the question itself just doesn't try to ask multiple things at the same time. So I'm, I'm essentially looking at a re one relationship between the spindle whorls and the loom weights. Now, if I was going with an experimenting approach, something that I explained in the beginning of the video, I might have started with some kind of average spindle whorl, average loom weight, and maybe I, put, I picked wool because I'm more comfortable spinning wool and I've spun wool for most of my experience. So, you know, that's how I would probably set things up if I was experimenting with these tools and my expertise. Unfortunately, this may be good for a personal experience, but it isn't good for the academic sense. The way that you can convey your information into a broader context that would be then useful for future archaeology or research, interpretation, follow-up experiments, because nothing has been so well defined so that it relates to the archaeology because it more relates to me. I picked an average, but I didn't say why. Unfortunately, this would not be very useful to those researchers who might want to take the results of my experiment and ask very specific questions that would then help them with their research. For example, if they asked me, well, why did you choose wool for your experiment? And I said, because I'm familiar with it, it doesn't help them understand something more about a past environment. Because if I had said, well, I chose sheep because there's a lot of information relating to sheep data from this time period because we have loads of animal finds. We have Michael Ryder's Sheep and Man book where he talks a lot about these um, prehistoric sheep breeds that would have been available. And that information would be useful, but what isn't useful, unfortunately, is I wanted to use wool. I wanted to interject a small little note here that if you are an experimenter and you like experimenting, don't take this as me saying you're doing it wrong because you're really not. What I'm trying to demonstrate are the differences between experimenting and experimental archaeology because they aren't synonymous, they can't be used interchangeably as terms because at its core it's very very different. It doesn't mean that you can't do experimenting the way that you've done it because ultimately that's a very personal choice. But if you are doing experimental archaeology, those personal choices do not matter as much as those choices that reflect more about past environments or past peoples because that is more relevant for an archaeological scholar than um, just knowing that someone has a favorite kind of wool they like to use. Another note is that 
just because I have isolated experimenting and experimental archaeology does not mean that experimental archaeology is only the reserve of scholars because there are many hobbyists out there who engage very critically in their experimenting that is often quite useful for experimental archaeologists or those people who are interested in taking some of the insights garnered from hobbyists who do a lot of academic level work. Doing experimental archaeology is not straightforward because it is largely dependent on the uh, question that you want to examine and the experimental archaeology process you want to utilize. So these will kind of change the way that you might go about setting up the experimental design or how you want to pick your variables so that you are looking at the ones that are most crucial to answer that question rather than trying to look at the whole sequence. However, it is also important to know at least something about the, the different sequences involved in making something so that you don't have a situation where um, let's say in mine, I didn't want a situation where I was just picking whatever fiber for my experiment because the type of fiber I used would be very important when I was investigating whether these uh, threads could be supported or could support heavy loom weights. In doing this process of looking at your research question and the process, you will also get a good sense of what your variables are and deciding which ones you can control and which ones you absolutely can't and decide whether you wanted to go more with lab-based controlled exercises, uh, experiments, or if you wanted to go with something that was a bit more actualistic. Last, you can also decide at this point which variables you can substitute with proxies because they have very little bearing on the research question and experimental design and therefore will not interfere with the results that you will come up with at the end. By the time you have done all this research, you will have a research question and an experimental design set up. And the last thing that you really need to make sure that you have in place is that the experiment design is structured in such a manner that it follows from the research question. So it's no help if you've tried to ask um, question A and your experimental design will qu answer question B. I've kind of been vague in the outlining, so let's put some real case study to this, and I will use the experiment that I did as a way of demonstrating how I went about creating my experimental design. The first thing I wanted to start with was flax, because that is the fiber material that I wanted to investigate um, and would have an impact on my finished product, so the reasons why I picked flax. In the preceding Bronze Age period um, in Britain, it was, among other plant fibers, a very important fiber, and it's something that we have in the archaeological record. It was also available in small quantities, at the very least at Danebury, my case study site. Flax also has different material properties that wool does not have that would be useful in an Iron Age environment. Flax has not been studied as part of an experimental program, as far as I know, and this would be a good opportunity to establish some research on this. The material qualities of flax include being able to withstand approximately twice the amount of tension that wool can, and this was very important because I was investigating heavy loom weights, and it felt like it was a good way to investigate how heavy loom weights work as part of a warp weighted loom setup without worrying or risking warp breakages. I wanted to foreground the many possibilities that flax as a fiber presents in an Iron Age context because with all the discussion relating to wool, the material qualities of flax get really underplayed and it reduces the amount of complexity and, and variability of cloth types that we think might have been available during the Iron Age. So those are some of the reasons why I went with flax. The next thing I needed to decide was which spindle should I use. Now I chose a 14 gram spindle whorl, which if it had a shaft in place might have weighed a little bit more, maybe 
17 to 20 grams total. Um, but I chose 14 grams because it was too large to be maybe questioned as a bead, but also too small to be questioned as maybe something completely different. Now, I am a hand spinner and I've used spindles not nearly as frequently as I use my wheel, but I use them fairly frequently because it helps me in my personal quest to understand more about materials and material qualities of, of hand spun yarn. So I didn't think I was capable of making all the hand spun needed for the experiment, but in this case, I wasn't looking to see if my hand spun would be good enough to be used on the loom. So what I did was I got my spindle and some uh, flax and I wet spun it for about 15 hours to create a sample that would demonstrate what a spinner could spin with this particular spindle given linen or flax as a fiber. The result of this experiment showed me that I could spin a yarn that was between 0.6 and 0.7 millimeters in diameter very consistently with this particular spindle. So I used a proxy Danbury example to produce yarn that would then give me a guide to pick a commercially wet spun uh, unbleached linen yarn that I could then use for my experiments because as much as I would have loved to use hand spun, I'm not very good at it yet. <laughs> and also, um, it wasn't important for me to test my personal skill in making hand spun, because that's not the question I wanted to look at. So in a sense, by using these commercial proxies, I have validated from my hand spinning experiment that this would work and I could, I could um, reliably back up that particular decision by having done the hand spun experiment when I moved forward with my commercially spun experiment. The other thing that this allows for is by using commercially produced yarns, if someone wanted to make a repeat of this experiment or if I wanted to in the future, it would be very easy to replicate it because the yarn is commercially available. So they could test my hypothesis and the result of my experiment without having to get hand spun directly from me. Last, and I can't emphasize this enough, people in the past were probably very, very clever, very creative, and they knew all the material properties of the stuff that they had to work with so that they can use it for all of their needs. So just because I might not be able to spin hand spun that's good enough for the loom, I don't want the experiment to fail because of my personal inabilities, but knowing that if in the past people needed this kind of expertise for survival, um, then they would probably know the best ways to make the yarn that I just have failed to perceive. Now, when I was picking which loom weights to use, I opted for triangular clay objects because their shape was uh, much easier for me to make out of clay because I didn't have access to chalk. Now, even though I used a proxy for the clay, it was still something that I could easily mold and produce the same uh, relatively consistent result from loomite to loomite. And modeling clay was a lot easier for me to do, whereas carving chalk wasn't so much. So I decided to go with that uh, shape first off and also um, that material. Another reason why I chose this particular shape is that for all the triangular shaped objects from my uh, sites at Danbury and the surrounding sites, they all had very similar parameters and the shapes are very consistent. So if you follow the CTR experiments that showed that those lumites that had very similar parameters, their thicknesses and their mass, it was more uh, probable that those objects reflected their use on a warp weighted loom. So given that in my sample I saw something similar, I decided to go with those particular objects rather than the ones that were more like clay or that were made out of chalk. There's also a little contention about whether these objects were suitable uh, for the loom 
or according to some uh, researchers, maybe these objects were more suitable as oven furniture because of the context in which they are found. So in the Iron Age, most often our loom weights, especially at, at my sites, they are not found in context of use. So you won't see these beautiful lines of loom weights that you might see in Anglo-Saxon period, but we'll find them either singly, sometimes they're broken, sometimes they're complete, but they're never in a convenient situation where you would imagine a loom having stood there. So whether it was a primary or a secondary or tertiary context, it's difficult to understand. So that's why some people think they're loom weights and some other people think that they are triangular oven bricks. By doing this experiment, I might be able to shed a little bit more light on this debate to foreground it, but also potentially add a line of evidence where we could say something more about the feasibility of these objects as lumites. Let's go back to that earlier question where the scholar asks, why did you choose this fiber? And in the original example, I said, well, I chose wool because I'm familiar with using wool. In the case that I could provide now, with uh, my experiment, if someone asked me why did I choose flax, I could cite all of these reasons why I chose flax and how it has potentially an impact on the spinning and why we have these spindle whorls and the loom weights and why they might be shaped the way that they are. That type of answer is much more meaningful for the wider community because it situates that knowledge in a way where it does reflect certain aspects about the past, despite the fact that there are a lot of unknowns where I can't say for sure that people in the Iron Age were using flax, but we know that flax is there and here's the experiment showing how I think it could have been uh, used as part of that. The one major caveat with experimental archaeology is that you have to be careful with the interpretation of your experiment and the results that you obtained. Experimental archaeology gains more credit the more experiments that you produce, both those that will repeat your experiment to check for the validity uh, and the replicability of your experiment, um, but also in the way that you can expand those initial experiments to check other parameters that maybe you didn't have a chance to or didn't need to check at the beginning, but now with this experiment having been done, necessitates you going back and checking on a specific parameter in greater detail. In fact, this is something that I did myself. I came up with a two-stage experiment where stage one took all of the parameters I wanted to look at and formed the experimental design into a working experiment where I could then test out how all these variables were working together to see if there was any hidden information that I might not have detected during my initial research and ex experimental design phase that would be useful for the next time I uh, did this experiment. Now what I just said about stage one and stage two experiments, setting up your parameters and checking to make sure it's all going to work, sounds an awful lot like experimenting and you would be right because that's exactly what I'm trying to demonstrate here is experimental archaeology takes on a lot of these principles inherent in experimenting where you're trying out different ideas, it's just adding a lot of structure to it so that it has a more meaningful impact for more people. For example, you're a weaver and you want to take a commission from somebody who has yarn and they want you to turn it into something for them. Well, you've never used this yarn before, so you might do a test strip to see, you know, if there's anything you should find out about it now before you do the full project. In a similar vein, let's say you have a recipe that you want to use, you try it out on your family first, get some feedback before you use it to produce a fabulous meal for a special guest. So here are two examples of how experimenting comes into play, and even within experimental archaeology, which is governed by a very highly specific framework, experimenting can still be useful so that you understand more about your experiment and root out anything that might cause problems later along down the line. Let's talk for a brief moment about crafting and being an academic, which is exactly what I am. It's kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, 
I might use a lot of my craft knowledge to make intuitions or certain decisions along the way that might influence the way that I set up the experiment or if I've made a decision about something and I haven't quite clarified why I've done it because it feels very intuitive to me, it isn't helpful if someone who doesn't have my particular craft knowledge tries to do something and they don't understand why I've made a decision that I have. One way you can go about this is by keeping a log of all your decisions and also taking photographs and videos if possible so that along the way if you decide you wanted to share this with somebody else to get a second opinion for example you could show them your logs, the photos, the videos and get their assessment which might be more beneficial than um, just having it a self-reflection aspect. So, um, whereas it's good to keep logs of all this stuff, it's also useful to uh, kind of check what your personal biases might be. And since I'm a crafter, I might be making some that if I weren't a crafter, I might not make. And I'd rather have it found through these means than uh, through published ones. <laughs> also, crafting intuition is very important when it comes to um, determining whether or not a, a particular experiment succeeds because, as I said before, if you have a lot of craft experience going into your experiment, then you might be in a position where your experiments are more likely to succeed because of this innate experience that you've developed versus someone where it isn't innate. Um, and that is an important factor relating to the replicability of your experiment and why I went with certain proxies because it isn't reliant per se on me and my crafting ability but it does kind of help me root out what my biases are by understanding that my craft knowledge is very specific and useful but that it's not necessarily important for someone to be able to do this experiment. The other thing that can sometimes happen with crafters who are ac academics doing experimental archaeology is there may be some tendency to overstate or overreach what an experiment can do uh, in terms of answering the question. So if you were to ask me personally what I thought my experiments managed to do, I think that they are very inspirational and can can change the way that we think about cloth types and the types of materials that people in the Iron Age might have been using and it also relates to my personal ideas about clothing and texturing the world so what were the household goods like by having done this experiment I can think th laterally through these ideas a little bit more but that doesn't relate to what my experiment actually does. So my experiment asked the question, is it possible that a spindle whirl from Danbury can produce yarn for the heavy loom weights found in association and weave with it? Let's focus on the word possible because that's all I wanted to do is demonstrate that it's possible. The fact that I did weave with these loom weights with the setup and I produce a piece of cloth that is theoretically feasible for the Iron Age, I can conclude with relative confidence that yes, it is possible. And that's as far as I can go safely. I still think to a certain extent the experiment that I did kind of, it, it, it's almost a little bit radical in the way that you think about cloth from this time period because Iron Age scholars tend to be very focused on wool, which, to be fair, isn't a bad idea, but because I'm drawing in flax to the equation, it does change how we perceive the Iron Age just because of its nature. The fact that I used flax and I produced a piece of cloth that is very different than what we might have conceived of had I not done this experiment in the first place. Now that I've done this experiment, it's really important to not just let it hover out in some no man's land. It needs to be recontextualized back into the body of work that's already been long established and the stuff that's being currently uh, researched. In the end, these experiments have revealed lots more questions than the question it answered. So even though I said, yes, it's possible that 
all of these factors can unite as a process to create a piece of cloth, it isn't the end all. I don't know whether it was um, culturally appropriate to use flax fibers in this way, or to use this particular spindle to produce this type of yarn that would then be woven in this sort of warp density. So there are a lot of assumptions I'm making going into this experiment, but it does serve as a baseline to begin exploring with further experimentation to see how these different variables relate. And um, it's possible that in the future I might get an opportunity to do this repeat experiment with wool to see the material differences with wool rather than just looking at the way that the different tool types relate in reference to flax. In conclusion, I hope I have been able to draw this out, but maybe if I haven't been as clear as maybe I wanted to be, there's a very fuzzy line between experimenting and experimental archaeology. You can't say that the words are interchangeable, but you can see how experimenting is part of experimental archaeology and how useful it is to advance how we do experimental archaeology because without our ability to engage almost scientifically with the world, trying to observe phenomenon and explain it and form hypotheses, then experimental archaeology couldn't do what it does. If you identify as an experimenter and you engage in experimenting, I hope that you also see experimental archaeology as a very useful framework that can have applicability with what you've already been doing, so that if you want to convey certain skills or certain ideas to other groups of people to enhance knowledge, um, not necessarily archaeological knowledge, but to uh, add some robusticity to the way that you do your experimentation, it is very useful also from a teaching point of view so that these types of skills that we have in craft don't just die out with the last people who have done them because it's very difficult to convey this from generation to generation or from person to person because it's often embodied knowledge and the way that we understand more about it is actually through the doing. So whether you are an academic or whether you are someone who reenacts, we can all learn something very important from the distinctions between these two uh, concepts, why they're there and why they are actually so very integrated with each other. All right, that's all for me. If you would like to hear more, please uh, subscribe and you will be notified when a next, the next video goes up. And also give me a thumbs up if you thought this was educational and hopefully not too long. Um, and if you have any comments or questions, please post them below and I will get back to you as I can. Thanks for watching. Bye!